Hello, and welcome back to Kvikminderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and on this podcast, I discuss 21st century Icelandic film with my good friend Ellie Cawthorn. To start, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our friends at Nordic Watchlist, an incredible website that focuses on all the amazing talent that comes from the Nordic region. Recently, I've been really enjoying their music recommendations, as well as all the coverage of the Netflix series Catla, including interviews with some of its stars. So I can count myself among esteemed company as they recently interviewed me all about Kvikminderpod and my love of Iceland. The article should be up today as this episode drops, and that can be found at nordicwatchlist.com. I'll also pop the link in the show notes and all over social media too. That's Twitter and Instagram, at KVIK. M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D. Now, this week our journey finds us travelling from one basement to another, escaping the freezing west fjords to return to the safety of the city. Reykjavik is home to a huge and diverse population for Iceland, and it's the centre of the country's culture, government and economy. So you'd be forgiven for not knowing about one citizen quietly making music on her own in her basement. This is a very musical episode. The film in question is Grandma Lo-Fi, or Amma Lo-Fi, from 2013. And thanks to this delightful documentary, I got to indulge in my love of the music of Iceland, as well as film. So thank you, Sigrithur. Over to you. Hello, Ellie. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. I'm very good. How have you been finding this series so far? Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, Really good. I think, actually, I've been enjoying this series more than the last, dare I say. Please explain. Um, Well, first we started off with Women at War, didn't we? Yep. Which, as I said at the time was my favourite film that we've watched. Fantastic. Then we had Creepy Creepy Horror with mm. um, I Remember You, which again, always, always love to see it. <laughs> uh, Child Ghosts, one of my personal faves. Noe Albanoe, not so much last week, but Grandma Lo-Fi was just a lovely little weekend morning watch. Yep, Grandma Lo-Fi, that's what we're discussing today. Also known as Amma Lo-Fi, which is the Icelandic word for grandma, subtitled The Basement Tapes of Sigrithur Nilsdottir. See, with the back catalogue we've had, the basement tapes, that could be a lot more sinister than it is here. Exactly. We've seen a lot of basements, haven't we? <laughs> uh, but not many that I'd want tapes from. No, especially not from Jar City. I don't want to think about the kind of tapes that that <laughs> guy had. But this is from 2011. It's directed by three different people. We've got Ingebjörg Birgestottir, Ori Jonsson and Kristin Björk Christianstottir. Now we'll come back to them later on because I discovered something quite exciting Ooh. about them uh, doing research for this episode. But this film is very different to everything we've looked at so far on mm-hmm. Crick Minderpod. It's a documentary for a start, and it's about music. Yeah. We haven't really touched on music too no, much, we have we? Which is why I was so excited when I heard Grandma Lo-Fi pop up in Noe Alba Noe, because it gave us the perfect excuse. Yeah, to lead in quite nicely. Mm. So this is the story of Sigrithur Niels Dottir, uh, who is half German, half Danish, moved to Iceland, and at the age of 70, decided that she'd use this keyboard she's got to make some music, and then recorded a whole bunch of albums across a period of about seven years or something? 50, 59 CDs in seven years. That's quite impressive, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I she think that, churned them out. That beats sort of any proper pop music record i guess trying to think of the most 
prolific bands. I mean, this year, Lana Del Rey's released two albums. <laughs> lazy. So lazy. And <laughs> she's is... half the age. <laughs> this is, I guess this is, wait, I'm just trying to do some maths. Okay. It's probably eight or nine CDs a year. Eight or nine CDs a year. So is she doing any, was she doing anything else at the time? We don't see a lot of her life, but what we do see is really kind of lovely and cute. I, I kind of... I wanted to know how you would describe this film if you could do it in like the tiniest mm, sentence. The tiniest sentence. I have a phrase in my mind which I could hear you saying. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, I want to know what you think I'd describe it as. Just a, a cute Nana film? Yeah, yeah, cute Nana film. Um, I would describe it as a homemade, janky, lovely... Um, janky? Janky, yeah. As in Meaning... Like, Meaning it's all little pieces kind of bolted together in a somewhat ramshackle way. Are you talking about the documentary or the music? <laughs> the docu- Well, both. Both. And I think that is one of the key reasons why I think it works really well as a documentary. Because the documentary is like a homage in the way it's made mm. to, to her music. It's like her music kind of brought... It's like a visual version of her music, isn't it? That totally. All of... A bit janky I'll say it again <laughs> and it's got a real kind of homemadey feel it does and I love the way that they use all of Grandma Lo-Fi's work mm. throughout so this film is basically told through her words through her music and through her images as well mm. which we'll come to but it's just a lovely little film it and it's only an hour long yeah <laughs> a lovely little hour yeah uh, we t- you were talking about it being janky i think one of the the key things that that plays into that is that the fact it's shot on super 8 and 16 Mm. mil so you've got this really kind of old school filmy grainy look yeah which to me anyway gave it a sort of timeless quality Mm, a bit like noe albanoe well i was gonna i was gonna ask you about this because i did some mental maths better than Mm. when i did some a minute ago (laughs) Um, in which, so so Grandma Lofi told us she's born in 1930 yes. and she's 70 when she starts making music. Mm. So that's two, the year 2000. <gasps> Good math Great there. Math. But, but the way it's shot looks like it could be 1960, it could be 1970 mm-hmm. or it could be 1980. It doesn't look like 2000 at all, does it really? And that's obviously a conscious choice and the way it's all put together, a conscious choice that they've made. Absolutely. I mean, so she started making in 2000, I think, this film was shot over seven or eight years between sort of 2003. I think it got released just after she died in 2011, which is which is quite sad, but that's a long time to make a film. And if you think about all the technological advancements that would have happened, that definitely did happen over the noughties, we don't see any of that. <laughs> no. She's using a Casio keyboard or some something of that description, which she calls the entertainer, which I don't know. I mean, I had something a bit like that in the mid nineties. <laughs> it's not, it's not contemporary technology. And she's got her cassette tapes, doesn't she? She does in that hi-fi that her daughters have bought her. So she's recording from a Casio keyboard onto a cassette tape. This is old school kind of analog tape to tape recording techniques, which I mean, there are people like Jack White recording properly analog these days. Really? Not, not tape it? to tape. He's doing stuff on vinyl and things like that. But he's not got a, himself an entertainer keyboard, has he? He's not just yeah. He's not playing on a keyboard, recording onto a, a hi-fi. But she's like overdubbing and she's recording effects onto tape and then putting them on top. And it's it's all very it's clever, mm. but it's very much not of the time. Mm. But that's why it kind of threw me when when I heard those dates because I thought that. As you say, it's on Super 8. I thought the whole thing was tapes that have been found from like 1970, not 2000. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, the, the title certainly suggests that someone's just found a pile of tapes yeah. and gone, wow, look at this. Like It reminds me of the way Asif Kapadia talked about Maradona, the film that he released a few years ago, where really that film could only be made because someone found a box full of home videos of Maradona and shared them so that he could make this film. It's not that. It's but it's it's kind <laughs> of made to feel that way almost, isn't it? Sort of. I mean, obviously, Grandma Lofi is is old, so it's not her making music in 
her midlife. Mm. This is her later life. But she wasn't. She wasn't making music in her midlife. Ex- no, exactly. So it. This is all very. It's all very contemporary. Just shot and recorded on old school technology. <laughs> it's great. Do we need to do a synopsis? I think I already did it. Oh, did you? Oh, did you? <laughs> was it, think... The synopsis is basically Grandma Lo-Fi when she was seventy started making music. Pretty much. Yeah. Let's watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Ja, jeg sidder her lige foran dig. Og jeg er, jeg er mange personer. Jeg er, jeg er halvt tysk og halvt dansk. Og så er, jeg, så er jeg blevet islandsk. Men jeg har også været otte år i Brasilien, så der har jeg også. Men jeg er det lille smule. Ikke? Min yngste datter er gift i Brasilien, og jeg har været derude også. Og det er skønt. Men altså, ja, hvem er man? Så so this is ostensibly a biography, biopic type mm. of film. It's certainly not as in-depth as something like Maradona or pick any other movie biopic at all, or bi- not biopic, biography, documentary. But we do learn a little bit about Grandma Lothar, and apparently she very much only gave the filmmakers what she wanted to tell them. Uh. So very early on they learned that they couldn't push her to do anything, that she would only give them the bits of information that she felt comfortable sharing. Actually, that's really interesting because I think you, I think they deal with that problem quite, not problem, but they deal with that um, condition almost quite well in the, in the film that there are points where there's almost like a gap in the narrative or there really isn't much information. Like her, her account of events of her childhood and when she kind of, when she falls in love for the first time is quite sparse but they really bulk it out and bring it to life almost with the way that they present it with the animation and Mm -hmm. stuff, don't they? And I think there are points where they add, kind of add some background, don't they? And also when we have these little interludes by other people who appear, that's another kind of exposition mechanism as well, isn't it? That we don't get from Grandma Lo-Fi. Yeah, so I guess anything they couldn't get her to say on camera, they were able to then Mm. use through these other methods which we'll come to oh yeah well uh, when when she's talking about she falls in love with a with a fisherman and yes. and actually she doesn't really say what happened does she i think in t- when she's speaking she says something like it's something very vague about like but things didn't go as planned or whatever but we obviously see a shipwreck depicted on mm-hmm. screen she never says that he was involved in a shipwreck does she not not straight not no. sort of specifically but she they says, fill in those gaps for us. Absolutely. And then she eventually says something like, I went to Iceland in case they found him, mm. sort of thing. So, yeah, the implication is that she fell in love with a fisherman slash sailor, whatever he was, who disappeared. And then, yeah, the beautiful animation shows, mm. a, shows a ship succumbing to nature, I guess. When I came home from the summer and told my parents that I had a good friend, so I said to my father, what does he do? He's a fisherman, I said. Ja, min datter skal ikke have giftes med en sømand, siger han. Du har ikke noget med ham at gøre. Jeg fik aldrig lov til, jeg fik aldrig lov til at møde ham. Jeg mødte ham altid, og vi blev kærester, ikke? Men det blev aldrig til noget, fordi skæbnen en gang til gav mig en lusing, ikke? But like you said, we don't learn much about her life. We hear that story from when she was 19. And it sounded like it was very much life in the 50s, I guess, or 40s and 50s, where her dad forbade her to see a sailor. Don't know why. He always counted out the money for her mum to go shopping. It sounds like it was a sort of a tight, somewhat sheltered kind of childhood. Which I guess is not that surprising in post-war uh, Denmark, because mm. don't forget she's she's Danish and she speaks Danish throughout this film. I assume she's singing in Danish. We don't get the translation for the lyrics, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, like you say, I think we get the sense that she had quite a restrictive upbringing. Mm. One of the the things I found really interesting is when she talks about the fact that she played an instrument as a child, but then suddenly she played piano, but suddenly. Her piano lessons had to stop 
presumably because the family couldn't afford it. And I think that's quite important, isn't it? A lot of people learn instruments as kids and then kind of lose the knowledge or drop it. And this kind of idea of you can pick it up later and still make something of it is lovely. Yeah, it makes me wish I'd learned at least some sort of instrument early on because, you know, she says, I don't know how to read written music, but she's still got that, still got that skill. She knows how to actually play a piano, which I, you know, I don't. It's never, never. It, well, this is inspiring because it is never too late. My mum started playing, she couldn't read sheet music at all. And when she retired a couple of years ago, she taught herself to play the clarinet just every single day she did practice mm. and now she's like pretty good and she didn't do any music at school so she's a she's a grandma lo-fi um follower of it's never too late to do what you love that's there amazing you go, Rob. We'll just wait till you retire and then you can start okay i will use this as inspiration it's certainly inspiring for a lot of people but you're right like it's it's amazing to see that that she came back to this skill that she had years and years ago. And uh, we don't really know what she did in her life. <laughs> she is quite mysterious in a way. Yeah, it's like, oh, when I was eight, I played the piano. And then when I was 70, I picked it back up again. <laughs> and in the middle, I was in Brazil. Had four children, is that right? I think so. At least two daughters. She was a dog walker. She worked in a shop. She made doilies on street corners in Sao Paulo. I mean... It sounds like if there was a person whose life you wanted to explore in full, she would be the kind of person. Like, mm. it sounds like quite an epic existence. But I quite liked that we didn't go into too much of her life story because that isn't really the story that we're that they're telling here. No. They're just telling the story of her later emergence onto the music scene. Exactly. And like, it's more like a look at creativity than a biography, isn't it? Yes, it absolutely is. And, you know... It's quite clear from all the guests that we see uh, that she was she was inspirational and she was an influence on Icelandic musicians and the art scene this in is, general. This is something I wanted to ask you about. Okay. So obviously not knowing anything about Grandma Lo-Fi coming into this, how much is she known in Iceland? Is she like a cult figure? Is she like, has everybody heard of her? Well, obviously, I'm, I, don't, I don't know. I hadn't heard of her until I saw the documentary. But we do see like tens of articles of her in the newspapers and the amount of people included in the documentary who are, you know, big names on the Icelandic music scene would suggest she was pretty famous and pretty well known. You know, it is a small country, like we always say. If you spot her walking around the street selling her albums, I, I imagine most people would at least recognise her, whether they like the music or not. So I think I think she's fairly well known. Mm. enough for a documentary to be made about her <laughs> but those people in the documentary that we see I love the way that they pop up and they sort of explain the story as you said and they're sort of buried in the animation and the collages because mm. that's something else Grandma Lofi did in her life was make collages amazing collages as well they are some of the best collages I've ever seen I love them <laughs> yeah better than her music Wow. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about the music in, in a little bit in fact let's talk about the music before we talk about the people who she's influenced what do you think what do you make of her music <laughs> i kind of love it's just joyous thrown togetherness mm. um in the way that she clearly just bashes it out doesn't worry too much it's a really great example of just not caring what anyone thinks of you and just being like, I'm having a great time. This is what I've made. Like it or don't like it. And that's your your decision. And the way that she just joyously flings in different things. So she'll have a dog, a load of dogs barking or she'll have like weird foley sound effects that she's made herself. And she clearly takes so much joy in it. I wouldn't say that I would maybe listen to it all day long <laughs> um, or have it on in the background but I could see how later generations of musicians would identify something in it that could be like played on yeah. into more popular forms of music it was quite um it had quite a nursery rhyme vibe to it at some point very much so and I think a lot of that comes from the presets on the 
on the keyboard. Partly that, and also the there's she says about how she's so influenced by religion and Christianity, mm. and I think you can you can kind of hear hymns in it as well. Yeah, certainly in the synthy hymns. Ones. Synthy hymns. That's a good phrase. I like that. What do you make of it? I really like the upbeat ones. Mm. I think the big, uh, the big one, the famous <laughs> one, I, whether we can say that, the one that I always remember, I think is called Nagrisina. And it's the one we see her sort of playing along to mm. where she's like, doom, 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 doom. That's a good one. And it's so good. It's so, it's like just really fun and upbeat. And I love that. And it's just, it is very much like giving a, a little keyboard to a child and saying, go play. Uh, but I, I love that. I love a kind of childish sort of sound. I'm less keen on the the religious-y ones that yeah. are, are hallelujah The synthy hymns. The synthy hymns. I like the ones that contain the kitchen rhythms. You know, like <laughs> yeah. the, the helicopter whisk. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, it's fun. It's not, you know, mm. groundbreaking. But I, what I really like, and it's what the, the musicians in the film are there to say, is that just jumping in, doing something mm. you love, having a bit of fun with it, and just going with it. I think we should all, to a degree, use that in our life. Because what harm is there in trying things out? Yeah. A part, a part of me was like, well, the way she jumps into playing the music on her keyboard, she doesn't really know how it works. It's a bit like when I try to start this podcast. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't really, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I certainly don't, you know, use the editing software as well as it could be used or even properly. But... <laughs> Here we are making a podcast. It exists. It exists and it sounds fine. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for just going for it. And that's yeah. basically what this film is is saying. Yeah, it's it's joyful watching her come up with her little um, sound effects and her tunes. So there's one bit, isn't there, when she... Um, she has foil to make the sound of crackling fire. Yeah. And the, like, look of, like... L laughing and hilarious glee. glee glee is the word <laughs> on her face as she does it it's just so lovely to watch and it's interesting to hear what she says about the music that she says something like um i had to make the songs because i just had so much music in me yeah. that i had to get it out and this i and she says about when she writes her which sounds incredible her album called is it cowboy songs or cowboy Cow life? cowboy blues or something <laughs> <laughs> cowboys <laughs> yeah her album about cowboys that she became she it was like she was possessed mm. and she just had to write them and i just love that she she kind of doesn't have much self-awareness i think a lot me like a lot of people i'm so like crippled by being like oh i can't do it because if i do it and it's bad people will think i'm lame yeah and she just you know she just does it because she loves it she's not doing it for approval she's not doing it to try and <laughs> you know impress anyone she's just like truly it sounds so cheesy but she's literally just kind of doing it from the heart and putting it out into the world that yeah. does sound cheesy but it does sound true. cheesy but it's true you know we definitely should all take a leaf out of her book i guess she comes from a, a generation that aren't addicted to social media and things where you know we get that gratification instantly or that trolling or <laughs> yeah. you know the negative stuff that comes with it She's just like, well, I literally no one in this space. There's no one here. I can make it. I can sell it. And people can either buy a CD or not. Can you imagine Grandma Lo-Fi on um, social media? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure 
what that would be. Yeah. I think she'd probably take photos on a analog camera, <laughs> use a shop to upload them to Facebook and then <laughs> transfer them across to Instagram or something. Yeah. <laughs> what I love is that she takes her recording, her cassette recording, to a shop that is apparently a CD manufacturing shop. Have they ever existed? <laughs> there was one in Reykjavik, apparently. Don't know if that's a thing, especially in the mid noughties Like everyone, and she doesn't have a computer. It seems like she calls her keyboard a computer because it has computer elements. But she can't. She's not recording and burning CDs, so she got to go somewhere. Fine. I mean, I honestly have no idea that had no idea that they existed. Uh, but she takes them from there, and then she sells them in Tolf Toner, Twelve Toner, the shop on. I can't remember what road it is, just down the road from the church. And, you know, they just sit there alongside all these other musicians and fair play. Yeah. I also love that she really doesn't care too much about, essentially about the rules of music. Mm -hmm. So she says like, um, I mean, she uses a pigeon's coo and she says, listen, see, sometimes it's in time, which is great. And sometimes (laughs) it isn't. And that to her is like, she's just happy with that, that it's out of sync, it's out of time fine that's just what it is it sounds nice to her yeah that's it i think that's to be admired as well she says some such such sweet things sometimes Talking about the the Foley effects, like, see, we've got the waterfall in the kitchen sink as well, haven't we? She's like, oh, everyone is free to use these tricks. I don't mind. Like, oh, oh, there's a whole century's worth of Foley artists out there. Like, we are aware of this. (laughs) (laughs) That you can use foil to make the sound of a cracking fire. But some things sound a bit like other things. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. It's so sweet. I also love her own um, man-made foley effects. So when she's doing the noise of of horses and just going, does she she do that? Yeah. Yeah. I know that she was uh, clippity clopping. Yeah. And that she says no one will be able to tell that that isn't a horse's hooves. Absolutely not. It sounds sounds exactly like coconuts. (laughs) Because <laughs> they sound exactly like Icelandic hooves as well. Uh, Icelandic hooves. They sound exactly like horses' hooves as well. Uh, but it did give us an opportunity to see some Icelandic horses. Yes. Well, that actually just takes kind of links onto that point I was saying about when there's gaps in the narrative that the the filmmakers can kind of fill those for us. What I thought was a really nice device is when she's doing the the foley effects. Let's just call them that of the horses or the waterfall or the fire that we see horses and we see waterfalls Mm -hmm. and we see fire and they really kind of bring it to life don't they absolutely it's so nice so so, uh, there's a slight disconnect between the and then the real horses who are running around in a field full of snow clearly not making that noise but yeah it's very sweet and really nice to see the wider landscapes of Iceland because we are very much confined to Reykjavik and to a basement a basement yes uh so nice to see that there's the outside world which well, i don't know we see her walk around Reykjavik a bit uh but we don't i don't know whether she got out any further than that i know she moved to the east fjords later in life but nice to see the the natural landscapes talking about her her music still what did you think of the section where she explains how she sang some of her songs in gibberish <laughs> I was that's one of my favorite moments where she's just singing along she's got her lyrics written out which are just nothing absolute gibberish what do you make of that um I did find that also entertaining I wonder if um we'd been able to you know if we were fluent Danish speakers mm. then perhaps it would have been more I guess it would have just been clearer because obviously obviously it's not Danish but you know because you can't understand really any of her lyrics and well, we're not given subtitles for them. No. I do wish that they'd given a su- given subtitles actually for when she was singing mm. because I would have loved to know. I'm, I'm sure that the lyrics are just hilarious and wonderful and weird. 
So it was a shame that we didn't get them. Yes, and the fact that we know there is a book of her lyrics that her mm. daughter made for her would be great. Some, if someone could translate that, it'd be really interesting to see what the songs say, especially mm. the one about cowboys. Mm. But again, the, the gibberish is just so joyfully delivered. And at the end, she says, uh, so she kind of does this karaoke style. Mm. Well, they present it as a karaoke style um, framing, really. Did, did you sing along? No, did you? you? Did, I did. Yeah, of course <laughs> I did. How did ah. you know the tune? Didn't. I you mean, don't it was quite obvious the what the tune was going to be. <laughs> I, it was just fun. I Amazing. love that. The little bouncing ball over the words. The gibberish was quite complex, though. Did you think? Well, maybe oh, it was just because it was kind of like a Danish person's gibberish. Maybe. I mean, I have been learning Swedish and I know a bit of Icelandic, so I guess I could tell what sounds yeah. they were supposed to be. Yeah. Um, but after after she does the little karaoke performance, joined by you, clearly, um, <laughs> she says, oh, you know, like, again, with childish wonder, like, oh, it's easier to just make up these words than to sing real ones. Yeah, it's much quicker to write, I think she <laughs> yeah. says. Much quicker to write this stuff. <laughs> Which is really interesting because Sigaros, Sigaros, they did a whole album of gibberish. I didn't know that. So Jönsi wrote or writes in what he calls von Lenska, uh, translations like Hopelandic. Um, so that whole album is mostly just sort of vowel sounds that sound vaguely like they might be words. But if you don't know Icelandic, no. why would you know any different, really? So there's that connection, which is fascinating, that they've both done this. I don't think Jönsi was influenced by Grandma lo but you never know. But people have written books and essays on the way the language works on the... It's their third album, the Bracket album. It doesn't really have a title, it's just two parentheses. But people have written so much about, you know, the way it's constructed and what the sounds are and how they work. But clearly, Grandma Lo-Fi hasn't put any thought into that. She's just like, well, that sounds all right. That sounds good. But sing it. It's easy. I love, I, I love that sort of contrast between Sigur Rós, who are Iceland's biggest export, absolutely critically lauded band singing gibberish, and then this lady making Casio mm. recordings in her basement, also singing gibberish. I love mm. it. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Um, and on the Sigur Rós note, the director is Yancy's sister. Oh, okay. Which I, I literally only found that out yesterday. And I think that's lovely. She mm. she knew of Sigrid Neilstotir and wanted to make a film about her. So that, I mean, maybe, maybe there was a influence there then. Who knows? Or an awareness. Yes, I So we've got the Sigaros connection. I mean, they don't pop up. None, none of the members of that band pop up. But we do have a lot of Icelandic musicians pop up. We've got members of groups such as Mum, 
uh, who are one who are semi big outside of Iceland. Uh, FM Belfast, who I was lucky enough to see when I was there a couple of years ago, in a bar called Hura, which it was such a fun gig. They're so fun as a band, and you can I I mean I could feel the influence mm. to some degree. It's that they're just that riotous. Let's have a bit of fun with music kind of thing. They wrote a song about running down the street in your underwear. <laughs> it's a great track. You should check it out. We've also got Sin Fang, who makes absolutely beautiful music. He's in a band called Sea Bear and Moogerson as well. And they all pop up and they've all got all sorts of, you know, careers spanning the last sort of 20 odd years. All very different, but all clearly influenced by Grandma Lo-Fi. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, they clearly are passionate enough about her to want to appear in this documentary in slightly strange and eccentric ways. Um, yeah being placed within her collages. Do you know what? I was even thinking, um, obviously they don't appear in this film, but um, even Dathi Frey, who obviously were Iceland's entry into Eurovision this year, their thing was very, um, you know, they had little synthy, handheld synth mm. keyboards, didn't they? Yeah. Which even that, I was like, that's got, gra Grandma Lo-Fi would have loved their songs. <laughs> yeah. I think. Absolutely. And actually, now you say that, I don't know if you or anyone follows them on Instagram, but on their way back from Eurovision when they had to quarantine, mm. uh, yeah, Davy set up just a little studio in his hotel room and he was just making animations for for music videos and things like that. And it's like... Very Grandma lo -fi. So Grandma lo -fi. So what should I do to pass the time? Well, music, you know, animation, just let's see what it looks like. Let's have a go. To so put up a green screen in his hotel room and went for it. I That's love that. That's nice, though. It's it's kind of the uh, an in cultural inheritance, shall we say? Yeah, it feels like that vibe is very. If you if you go to Iceland, if you go to Reykjavik, and you immerse yourself, or not even need to immerse yourself, just be surrounded by the art art scene. It feels like that's very much just the way to everyone goes about. It. It's like, by the way, I'm doing this art show. By the way, I'm going to do this gig and put them together. See yeah, what happens. Exactly. It's great. <laughs> So they all appear in, in her collages, but I didn't realise until later in the film that they were her collages. Me neither. And I'd be interested to, to know what elements of the kind of collages that became animations, what was direct from Grandma Lo-Fi's own work and what was added in by yes. the filmmakers. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because that first one that we see, uh, which I think is the guy from FM Belfast, there's a running waterfall and there's a crackling fire. But there must have been a waterfall in the collage and waterfalls obviously synonymous with Iceland. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of waterfalls in Iceland. I couldn't tell which one that was. <laughs> but it was really nice to see. They must have gone out and filmed that specifically to put in. Mm. Uh, but I assume there was a waterfall in the collage originally. But I also liked when when the kind of drawn animation collage elements came into the... So obviously we had real people appearing against a back drop of collage mm. but we also had the collage elements brought into the the normal vi straight video content so there was one of my favorite moments it was like incredibly simple was when grandma lo-fi was talking about her faith and what it meant to her mm. and how it inspired her to make music and as she was speaking it was just a very simple shot of her and then a little animated bird came and landed on her yeah. shoulder for a moment and then flew off and it was so simple, but really added something to that scene that 
would have just been a quite straight, not very memorable shot. It really gave it a little, a little lovely grandma lo-fi esque tone to what could have been quite a boring. Shot. Yeah, yeah. I think I think a lot of this film feels quite whimsical. Is that okay yeah, to say? I think um, so. And that's that that kind of thing plays into that. I think it just elevates the the standard. Here's our subject sitting at a piano. Yeah. I think it's when you say whimsical that has quite negative connotations isn't it and it and there are moments where it's very say like Wes Anderson-y mm. but it doesn't feel surfacey or contrived because it's all inspired by it's all done in the tone and the style like a homage to Grandma Lo-Fi isn't it so it feels appropriate to have stuff like that not just like oh it's so quirky exactly and it all plays into what she's talking about, how she feels, and just the whole general ethos. Everything feels as of a piece. One person we haven't mentioned who pops up in those collages is the cellist. Now, mm. I was I was watching it thinking, I know who that is, but I cannot for the life of me place her. Uh, and it's actually Hilda Gudnadottir, who, I don't know whether you keep your eye on the BAFTAs or the Oscars, but last year, 2020, Hilda Gudnadottir won the best original score at both the Oscars and the BAFTAs for the soundtrack, well, for the score to Joker. Really? Yeah. She's the composer who has done so many amazing things. She's worked with Denis Villeneuve a lot, so she did the soundtrack, she did the score to Sicario, Prisoners, Arrival... Like, these are amazing films. And I don't know if you remember the Sicario soundtrack. Uh, she should have won the BAFTA for that. All inspired by Grandma Lofa. Yeah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? It's like, how how do you get from there to there? But, you know, inspiration comes in many forms and from different ways. And if it just meant that she decided, okay, well, I can play the cello and I'm a musician. Maybe I should branch mm-hmm. out and try for those soundtracks or, yeah. or what have you. Or just get in touch with someone who might want to work with her. That's all it takes for someone to inspire you to just do one thing for then your career to go through the roof. I mean, you don't get much different from the soundtrack to Chernobyl, do you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, she, I mean, she also did. There's a Danish film which I really love called A Hijacking, which has a couple of cast members from The Killing in, which is, it's sort of like a Danish Captain Phillips Mm. Um, which is brilliant so he would check that out uh, and she also did The Oath which is a Balthazar Kormakur film which we've not discussed yet which no. you know we might come to one day um, but she's she's amazing I'm going to go and check her out on Spotify yeah brilliant <laughs> So just, you know, you never know who you're going to include in your documentary and who might be inspired by the subject of your documentary. Actually, I had one point that I didn't mention when we were talking about Grandma Lo-Fi's music. Oh, yeah. Which is, because it's so unexpected, like you never know what's going to happen in it, whether there's going to be a pigeon or like (laughs) a very weird vocal. I listened to this, I watched this film with noise-cancelling headphones on. Um, Okay. So I had the sound... Which actually I think I would recommend. It was a really good way to watch it because then the music was like really in my in my mind. Yeah. But what was <laughs> my fire alarm went off and I didn't <laughs> realise partly because cause I had my noise cancelling headphones on but because it was just like a weird like boop, 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 boop. I was like, ooh, Grandma Lo-Fi has introduced some slightly unusual um, beeping yeah. alarm sounds into this <laughs> latest hit. <laughs> Not unexpected. <laughs> so be warned, everybody. Always make sure <laughs> that you, uh, your fire alarm isn't going off at the same time. That's brilliant. <laughs> I love that. And talking of musicians and her music specifically, just a couple of thoughts that I had were like, so she's using these presets on the keyboard and just like, oh, I'm not even that's sure. that's one of my favourite bit, bit. Sorry to interrupt. The presets on the keyboard Go on. Um, coming to life oh, through yeah, animation. Great animation. Yeah. The tango and the, yeah. the pasodoble, which she struggles to say. But she's using those presets 
as you would, especially if you were new to the instrument, just be able to play along to something. And it's one of those things that I worked on a documentary a few years ago called Sound of Song, and we were looking at modern music and synths and all of this kind of thing. And we spoke to the musician John Grant, who mm. lives in Iceland. Big synth man. He's a big synth man, lives in Iceland. Uh, the cover of his second album, Pale Green Ghosts, is actually in a cafe in Reykjavik. It's a cafe called Mocha Cafe. But we were, we were talking to him about synths and stuff. And apparently in the, mu- in the music world, there's very much those people who disapprove of using presets. And I think this it, it mostly applies to real crazy synths that have programmed sounds. But it also applies to, you know, your little Casio Tango preset. Uh, but people, proper musicians, hate it. If it's not your sound, why are you using it? But John Grant's absolutely like, if it exists... Yeah. Why not use it? And that's exactly Grandma Lofi, isn't it? She's like, well, it's there. I'm going to take it. I'm going to make music and I'm going to... And people love it. Mm. And proper musicians like her stuff and have been influenced by her stuff. So it's not like you can't make proper, in inverted commas, music yeah. out of stuff that already exists. I that, mean, yeah, That is silly. something refreshing and nice about this documentary, isn't it? That in theory, it's, it's a music documentary, I guess, in a way. Mm. But music documentaries so often can be quite kind of self-important and yeah. quite snobby about the craft of making music. Yes. And, you know, how was this absolutely seminal album made <laughs> and the genius behind it? Yeah. Whereas this is just about like, it doesn't, it doesn't put music on a pedestal, does it? It's just like music is just out there in the world, chuck something together, see what happens. Making music is like Grandma Lo-Fi um, presents making music as something that like anyone can do with no experience, with loads of experience. A child could do it. A dog can make music <laughs> in a way. Yeah. And that's quite refreshing, I think, because I sometimes find music documentaries and music journalism and things to be too self-important yeah righteous righteous yeah i think those kind of documentaries that explain exactly how these amazing songs were put together they have their place and it is Mm. fascinating to find out how the songs you love were made but there is the other end of the spectrum it's like music is accessible we can all do it if we want to and this is what the film is saying isn't it it's like Mm. just just go for it i've probably said that like a hundred times in this podcast but it's true Talking of music documentaries, it really reminded me of... There's a, there's a documentary by a guy called Jeff Fierzig called The Devil and Daniel Johnston. Now, I don't know if you know Daniel Johnston. Uh, he died a couple of years ago now. But he was this big cult figure who made music from his house. And he was just incredible. And he had mental health problems and things. But he just made all this music... American musicians fell in love with him. Kurt Cobain was seen wearing his album cover on his T-shirt. He's, I mean, he's he's pretty big. Um, but it reminded me of that in that it was just showing how anyone, literally anyone, with a penchant for music can just go and do it. Uh, so I would absolutely check that out. That's a recommendation, The Devil and Daniel Johnston. And again, you don't need to know his music to, mm. to enjoy his story and enjoy his music and there's another documentary music documentary which is a bit more serious but not really it's called screaming masterpiece uh in icelandic because it's an icelandic documentary uh gargandi snillit which is from a few years ago now which we you know we might cover at some point as well but it's about the icelandic music scene of the noughties and all the well not necessarily the noughties it came out in the noughties but it covers people like björk sigaros slow blow who were the Guys who yeah. did the soundtrack to Noe Albanoe and obviously included Grandma Lo-Fi on that soundtrack. Uh, and they also were on the, the lineup for that concert. We only see a quick clip where mm. Grandma Lo-Fi is saying how musicians put on a concert of her music and Slow Blow were on there with Moom as well. I wish we got to see that. Yeah, that would have been good, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I, yeah, I guess it's a film about her, but it would be really nice to see them playing her songs. Or see, because... Mm. One of the contributors says how hard it was to sort of translate her little piano ditties into a fully fledged like band Mm. song. But it would have been really cool to see some of those uh, transferred. But anyway, Screaming Masterpiece, fantastic documentary as well. And hopefully one day we'll get to cover that too.
I think we've gushed over Grandma Lo-Fi enough. But were there are there any final things you wanted to mention? Um, the only thing that I thought perhaps was not really explored, and I know that you've said Grandma Lo-Fi shared what she wanted to share and didn't share what she didn't want to. But there was a point towards the end where it says, okay, so she she moved to the East Fjords and she stopped making music and she did collages instead. Mm. And I that just felt a little bit sad to me because I felt like we needed a bit more um, explanation of that. Was there a reason why she stopped? She seemed to get so much joy mm. from music that it seemed strange to me that that was kind of just thrown in and then not mentioned at all. And... I mean, even if it was that she she just poured her creativity into a collage instead, if that could have been spelled out a bit clearer, mm. then that, that would have been helpful. Yeah, it would have been nice. I, I wonder whether there was some sort of health thing, you know, because yeah. she died very soon. Well, she died before the film was released. So whether there was a reason, that was the reason she moved back to the East Fjords, I don't know. I wonder if she got to see any of what the film was going to look like. Well, I know that the filmmakers were spent obviously they spent years with her so it'd be nice to think that they showed her clips of what they'd shot already but mm. i don't know hopefully uh certainly her family had, have seen it all yeah but those collages what a way to end your career mm. to just suddenly start doing well not suddenly but she's been doing it but to just go full into making those collages and i really like some of them yeah the obviously the one with the waterfall is cool the swans and the ballerinas fantastic <laughs> yeah you know and so i sand it because they're just pictures mm. cut from magazines and newspapers so those swans were on churn in the lake mm. slash pond in the center of Reykjavik. and there's another one where there's a swimmer coming out of the pond which i really liked as well mm. lovely and creative and it just goes to show you know we've talked about all of the actors actresses directors musicians they've all got other jobs and here's another example. I mean, this mm. lady's had a million different kinds of jobs. Mm. But even right up to the end of her life, she was still changing it up. Yeah, which is great. She didn't just realise, I'm quite good at this music thing, I'll just stick to this. She just poured creativity into whatever she did. Exactly, exactly. I wonder who owns her CDs or who bought her collages because it would be mm. really cool to see them in situ. Or just, I just love to know who owns them and whether they listen to them. Um, or whether they just display the album covers because her, her art is really cool mm. and I love those album covers Yeah, it looked like 12 Toner had one of the collages on the wall in there and I probably saw it when I was there and had no idea what mm. it was but it would be really nice to know who's got those records and who's got the collages and yeah. what they're doing so if someone has got them please share it, share us let <laughs> us let know us where know. they are and how much enjoyment you've had from Grandma Lo-Fi. Do you know what, Rob? There's a nice space on the wall there that a Grandma Lo-Fi collage would look very nice on. I think it would, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how do I get my hands on one? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that positive note, that's it, isn't it? I mean, yeah. what more is there to say? Grandma Lo-Fi, what a legend. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll go down in Icelandic history for sure. And hopefully we can uh, we can spread the word and get people, you know, if not listening constantly listening to her music to some degree or having a little tinkle on the entertaining an entertainer keyboard themselves absolutely i wonder where that is as well the entertainer mm -hmm. hopefully this will inspire many more people to go off and make their own music or make their own films because uh, that would be the the ultimate outcome i suspect mm. so if we're emerging out of grandma lo-fi's basement where are we <laughs> heading next well, we're heading into the countryside. Mm -hmm. So Grandma Lo-Fi was a, uh, a rather fun, nice, upbeat film. We're going to end the series <laughs> no. on a rather darker note. We're heading out into the countryside with our fave, Ingvar Sigurdsson, for a film quite unlike anything we've watched so far. Okay. Uh, it certainly uses different techniques in terms of telling the story it is a fictional film it's not a documentary we're back on back to feature films again but it's basically about a police officer going through a hard time and okay. i don't really want to ruin anymore because there's not much of a story based film there is a very small story and it's very much about atmosphere and the character and what the character goes through okay internal struggles 
Internal struggles of a police officer. Yes, of an off-duty police officer. Sounds good. Mm, I'll see you there. See you then. Rest in peace, Grandma Lo-Fi, but rest assured your legacy will live on through those artists you've influenced and through those who have seen this beautiful biography. For the next film on our journey, A White White Day, we're travelling away from Reykjavik and toward the southeast of the island. Brace yourself, but enjoy. Ingvar's back. For the next film on our journey, A White White Day, we're travelling away from Reykjavik and toward the southeast of the island. This is a change of direction both geographically and thematically from the other films already discussed on this series of Kvikminderpod. If you're in the UK, this film is on BBC iPlayer for another week or two as the episode drops. Otherwise, it's widely available on DVD and Blu-ray or to rent or buy online. And as we record, it's only 99p to rent on Amazon. Don't forget that we can be found on all the podcast platforms and Instagram and Twitter where we are at Kvikminderpod. So follow us, like us, review us, talk to us, and keep spreading the love for Icelandic film. Oh, and keep your eyes on the podcast feeds, as we may have something a little extra for Halloween. See you soon. Tack Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>